All right, after the 24-hour Wagner-led mutiny, everything is back to normal inside of Russia. No, not really. Turns out this thing is far from settled. After announcing that he and Putin had come to terms and that his men would be returning to their field camps, Prigozhin's gone dark. All right, just kidding. So after recording all of this, Prigozhin came out with his first audio statement since this all kind of wrapped up, I guess. So he starts by saying that the March for Justice, as he's calling it, was about stopping the destruction of Wagner, not about toppling Russian authorities. He added that the objective was to not allow destruction of Wagner and to take responsibility those who, with their unprofessional actions, made a huge number of mistakes during the special military operation, adding that all of the military they met along the way supported this. He then said that the march showed many things that were demonstrated before, including serious security concerns around the country, adding that all military bases and airfields were blocked. And a big one here that I thought was interesting, he said, if actions on 24 February 2022, so the start of the full-scale invasion, were done by forces trained by Wagner, the special operation could have ended in one day. This shows the level of organization that the Russian army should be following. As a quick refresher, the deal that was supposedly reached, according to Russian Press Secretary Dmitry Peskov, is that charges would be dropped against Prigozhin, who would then leave Russia for Belarus. Wagner fighters who took part in the mutiny would not be charged, and those who did not would be absorbed into the Russian Ministry of Defense. But overnight, Russian media started reporting that the criminal investigation into Prigozhin around the organization of an armed mutiny had not been closed and is ongoing. I'm not qualified to make a prediction as to where this all goes. To me, it's starting to get into the weeds of Russian domestic politics, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in that field. I can see both sides of the argument as to how this whole thing shakes out, but it just seems like there's way too many unknowns right now. On the one hand, there are people just calling for Prigozhin's head, upset that he appears to have gotten away with this whole thing. Andrei Gurulov, the former deputy commander of the Southern Military District and a current member of the Russian Duma, said, quote, Our military personnel died. They died from the blows of specific individuals. Who gave the command? Who launched the rocket? I believe that the investigative committee will thoroughly deal with the issue and make a decision, end quote. He's, of course, referring to the Russian aircraft shot down by Wagner forces that resulted in the deaths of at least 13 service members. And I can see how that idea could gain some traction. I mean, maybe you can sort of wash away or forget the statements made by Prigozhin and Wagner, but the loss of life being swept under the rug could make quite a few people angry. Following a similar sentiment, Igor Gurkin came out and said that, quote, hanging the cook, a reference to Prigozhin, for mutiny and the murder of our officers is simply necessary for the preservation of Russia as a state, end quote. The other side here is that any major move like that could be dangerous to Russian leadership. This is kind of a hard one to dial in. We just don't know the level of support for Wagner and Prigozhin across Russia. I mean, they appear to have been welcomed in Rostov, but how does that translate across the rest of the country, the elites and the military? Prigozhin has also gained some traction as kind of the one guy who actually cares about his men. The one person who presents the truth of war while the Russian leadership misleads their people about casualties and progress at the front. I can understand how that whole portrayal could garner some support, especially from those who have family members currently involved in the fighting. So again, not a data point easily obtained here from outside of Russia, but if Prigozhin is viewed in a positive light by enough people, then his detainment or death could risk additional unrest. I don't know, but the same as the first scenario, I can kind of understand both perspectives. As soon as this whole Wagner mutiny thing kicked off, questions started to arise about how this would affect the ongoing war in Ukraine. As of now, June 26th does not appear to have had any immediate impact, but it did raise some questions. For starters, Wagner was not holding any positions along the front, so their departure from Ukraine didn't open up any sectors for Ukrainian forces to push through. Additionally, this whole ordeal was over fast enough that it doesn't appear Russia had to relocate any assets from Ukraine to Russia to try to put this thing down. So no direct impact on the front, but Prigozhin's rather unopposed march across Russia did make it look as though the vast majority of Russian military power is in Ukraine. I mean, there were some pictures of military assets mobilizing in Moscow, but it was pretty sparse. And next thing you know, the Chechens were headed that direction to protect the capital. This is just a few weeks after Kadyrov and his men were tasked with securing the border in the Belgorod region. Throughout this war, an often repeated theory from the Russian side is that only a small fraction of the Russian military is actually involved in the fighting in Ukraine. This seems to push against that theory. I mean, there was a Russian military response against the Wagner column, but it took the form of attack aviation. 
really nothing in terms of ground forces showed up to block routes or set up and defend key infrastructure in and around Moscow. Now, there are still Russian forces scattered all across the country, but this little episode showed me that the vast majority of their combat power, at the very least, is in the Ukrainian theater of operations. Big picture, that plays into something I mentioned before about a stagnant fight at the front. What we're seeing is the full Russian military in action. There's not some major force being held back in reserve. Moving over to the battlefield. While Prigozhin's march to Moscow was the focus of attention over the last few days, Ukraine made some notable gains in the battlefield, including a small bridgehead across the Dnieper River. The last 48 to 72 hours have seen Ukrainian progress in three areas of the front. From northeast to southwest, that was Bakhmut, Rivnipil, and Kherson. As is the case with any changes of territorial control during this offensive, even video confirmation needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Many of these areas are taken, then retaken, or at least fought for for some time, even as these reports are coming out. At Bakhmut, the commander of the Ukrainian 3rd Separate Assault Brigade stated that they had pushed Russian forces back across the Donbass Canal south of the city. I haven't seen this updated on any maps yet, but if it's accurate, that'd be roughly three kilometers of progress for the Ukrainians. Then Russian military blogger Wargonzo did today announce that Ukraine was able to take new positions around Bakhmut, but did not provide details as to where or how far Ukraine advanced. Then earlier today, June 26th, reports, including this video here, came out that the Ukrainian side had recaptured Rivnipol. The taking of this settlement would mean that around 120 square kilometers on the Velka Novosilka front has been recaptured by Ukraine over the last three weeks. Then in Kherson, an area of the front that hasn't really seen a lot of fighting over the last three weeks, reports came out over the weekend that Ukraine may have moved forces across the river and established a small outpost on the Russian-occupied bank. Eventually, footage was released showing Russian forces engaging the Ukrainians in this area, and Russian media confirmed a fight there was ongoing. A few days ago, Russian media was talking about increased attacks in this area, and then this morning, some Russian channels are acknowledging that the area may have been taken by Ukrainian forces, whereas others are saying the fog of war is too thick to confirm or deny the Ukrainian advance. Pro-Russian military blogger Two Majors posted, quote, Enemy forces of up to 50 people are operating on our territory, in the dark, building up the group and supplying it with ammunition and technical means. On our shore, the enemy has mobile electronic warfare installations. Our FPV drone operators could not complete the task of striking. The request of aviation to strike the base of the bridge and on the enemy's shore, which the enemy uses as cover from artillery and mortars, turned out to be unanswered." End quote. This is one of those items where it's both a big deal but at risk of being overhyped. The idea of an amphibious operation to cross the river has been a hot topic for a few months now. Generally, I think the complexity and the risk of that isn't fully understood and personally did not view it as a viable option. But then the dam was blown, flooding out Russian positions and reducing the water level at a handful of areas downstream. One Russian soldier who claimed to be involved in the fighting there said that forces were moved out of that area to help in the defense near Zaporozhye, and they were only later backfilled with mobilized soldiers who lacked night vision devices. Two majors, the pro-Russian military blogger, added, quote, The enemy has a foothold. There are not many enemy there, but they sit tight. Adding, quote, The assault by our infantry failed. There are losses in armored vehicles, end quote. As of this report, I'd say that this is just an area to keep an eye on. It really could go either direction. If the Ukrainian force there really is only about 50, then containing or removing them shouldn't be too difficult a task for Russia if they're able to redirect resources to the area. On the other hand, it sounds like air power hasn't been available, and for whatever reason, the Ukrainian forces have been there for three days. Should this materialize into something more for Ukraine, it's worth noting that a push in this area would bypass some of the more substantial Russian defensive lines. Russia had been leveraging the natural barrier of the river for their defenses in this area, and their defensive posture there is not nearly as robust as they are further north around Zaporozhye. But holding and exploiting a bridgehead across a body of water is a very, very difficult task. I mean, as a reminder, we just have to look back to this last fall where Russia was forced to withdraw across the Dnieper in this same area. But that's all I got for now. Be sure to check out the national security sit reps I put out on Substack regularly. If interested, link is in the description. Thanks for watching. I'll see y'all next time.